Well, Salman, it's, it really is a delight to see you and thank you so much for being part of Relations Diaspora and painting. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, um, it was a, it's a rare opportunity to like, you know, have be part of an institutional show and it happened very early on for me. So thank you so much for making me a part oh. of it. And, you know, um, and the, the work that is part of the show is also, um, was sort of the first of its kind. And it's one of the very few paintings that sort of happen, you know, the, the first time. In the first go, it was just like, oh, wow, this is great. And I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that it's, um, you know, that it's traveling in another part close by in the world um, outside of the US. Well, it does feel like a million years ago that, you know, we first came to your studio yeah. and visited you in Brooklyn. Um, and then there was the Whitney show yeah. that really kicked your butt into high production. <laughs> yes, so that was, uh, you know, a show that um, Grace and Ambika, two curators from the Whitney, um, came to the studio and Ambika had been familiar with my work for a while. And I had been going through different um, kind of um, evolutions very quickly through in 2015. Um, and I'll get back into it a bit later, but um, so she had been looking at my work for about five years. And eventually when I had a show in 2018, it was a very personal show to me. I felt like I found a place where I could, a way of painting where I could settle down. Um, I had trained as an academic painter. I planned to be an academic painter in the, like, like around 2009, 2010. And um, I kicked out of my practice as hard as I could. Uh, and then I did some wild things, <laughs> uh, like formally in painting for me, I mean, uh, personally. And then I settled into this like more kind of narrative space, which I felt was uh, honest uh, and quick because I wanted to tell stories. And so I had that show and Ambika saw it and she came to the studio with Chris and they were just like, well, you know, this is a bit of a surprise, but uh, this was the third visit and I was kind of wondering what's, you know, uh, I was excited, but I didn't know exactly what was going on. Uh, so they said, well, you know, would you be able to do a show in Mar in like February? Like, and this was already, I think, August yeah. um, in 2019. 2019. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, my, obviously my immediate reaction was like, I will, do it somehow. I don't, <laughs> I don't understand how, but I will make it work. I'll go at top speed and like. Um, so usually I take a year and a half <laughs> to make to make a show. So you know, even from the outset, we did think that we would borrow works um, from uh, maybe like a quarter of the show would be earlier work, um, and then the part of it that was new, ten paintings approximately. I would make them specifically for the show. And, um, you know, I, I ended up being on time, <laughs> which was great. Uh, and now at this point, it's surreal because, you know, I've, uh, in my studio, I've done, I'm, you know, like that work is now in the past for me, the, the work <laughs> in the Whitney show. Uh, there were lots of kind of prototypes of paintings in that show that gave birth to like, you know, a whole array of narratives in the studio. And so now I'm embroiled in that. And so when the show opens, it'll be, it'll be a very pleasant step, you know, back in time to see like where all these other ideas came from. Like those are, those paintings to me are not like these kind of, um, almost like these gods that I can't really like, uh, uh, you know, um, um, outdo. Uh, that happens a lot uh, with painting uh, with me. Um, I feel like, usually like paintings for me they age well so that I'm just like when I'm doing a new painting I feel like you know if I'm stuck I'm thinking how did I do that can I just like look at that again and you know for me that's also a little bit of like cheating uh, because I try and like you know whenever I'm painting the studio is empty I'm not looking at anything not a picture or nothing so um, and that usually works for me, and um, sometimes I get stuck. So now the Whitney show is full of, you know, uh, the paintings that, um, in my imagination, <laughs> have become these uh, kind of legends that are just like, wow. I mean, how do I, 
wow, you know, how did that moment happen? Um, and um, so I'm very, very excited about it. The show had been seen, had it been seen at all by, by press and critics in that sort of mid-March period? Because there's some wonderful writing and it was, you know, sort of like critic, very excellent critical attention. I was so grateful for that. Um, at the work, I don't think, maybe some of it had been seen, you know, in um, digital form, but we hadn't put the show up. We still okay. had to hang it. Uh, so lockdown happened as soon as the paintings were just taken by the museum. And then we didn't have a chance to install it because then that was completely shut. So, you know, we're gonna do that in the first week of November. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, you know, um, to see uh, Chris and Ambega and also the paintings again. Um, and, you know, it's always, uh, it's a completely different context when, when paintings come together from different parts and then make a show and then, then they start speaking to each other. And mm -hmm. it's very different from my relationship with them in the studio. Usually, you know, I, I'm, I'm not very one-on-one -on -one <laughs> this is like the painting for me is like the whole world because uh, I feel for me personally it's kind of, I feel it's dangerous that if I if I think of it as part of a group so I never really think of series it has to stand on its own legs um, and so for me the exciting bit is that the conversation among the paintings becomes for me like exponential like it's like it's great because then they sort of uh, kind of multiply in their, in their uh, context. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm very excited to see these paintings come together because some of them, about 10 of them I've seen in the studio together, but there are additional five that were from the year before that are also going to join these. Um, and, um, you know, the, I guess the paintings also summarize a lot of the things that I'm interested in and will, you know, continue to engage with like, safe spaces, immigration, um, kind of um, a bourgeois urban life, um, domesticity and art history, um, and uh, a kind of movement in the diasporic context uh, and immigration context between uh, empowerment and passivity or humiliation. Um, and that's really important to me to have that uh, to have a sense of fun and to kind of, you know, paint in the way that I would love to dance or to strut down the street, but also to, uh, because, you know, there are imaginary paintings to revisit uncomfortable memories or and also, you know, get into ideas about how I see myself or how I imagine I'm seen or how do I see my <laughs> community of origin and what are the parts of that, that I bring with me and, you know, make them make part of my personal philosophy living here in a Western metropolis uh, where the, you know, uh, kind of liberal progressive values are apparent. Um, and um, so how do you, you know, what do I choose from among those things to uh, create a kind of, um, yeah, I guess like a, a personal philosophy um, and and um, an unconventional sense of family. Um, you know, oh, so... <laughs> I love that. Sorry, I've dumped a lot of ideas. It's, um, no, it's wonderful. Um, I would really love to engage you in a discussion about your earlier days. And it'll, you know, sort of be a nice segue into talking about a, this sense of, of kinship that you've, um, you know, sort of developed and, and nurtured. Did you always know you wanted to be an artist? And was it always painting? So um, I did always know that I wanted to be an artist. Um, and that was like, a, I was a problem <laughs> child for my parents that way. Uh, so I was drawing pretty much all the time. Um, and um, for me, that was very important because um, I had a, I had a very vivid and wild imagination and I had like sort of, I, you know, a imaginary friends that existed only in drawings as a little child, as a young child. And also, um, you know, I was very kind of effeminate and very obviously queer and like, you know, 
Um, and I, so there was a lot of bullying and a lot of teasing and a lot of like, it's a very macho culture in which I grew up. Uh, there was a lot of um, homophobia. I feel like even to a certain degree, like there was like misogyny. <laughs> and so, you know, drawing uh, and also looking at images was a way for me to escape and to create fantasies that would become really important to me. Um, and, you know, that sounds like such a loser territory, but it was so, so vital, like, you know. Uh, and along with that, actually, like, as I was drawing, I was also exposed because I was raised in a conservative middle class context. And a lot of um, middle class households have items that would like at the West would sound like funny, like, you know, um, just like, you know, porcelain figurines of like white people being like genteel <laughs> cafe tea and, you know, like shepherds and shepherdesses, like, and like cheap prints of like Thomas Gainsborough portraits. And um, we had that we grew up in the same house. <laughs> I'm so glad. I, I, this never happens. Oh, wow. That's incredible. <laughs> uh, so I guess like I had the, uh, you know, and uh, privilege to find exotic things to just like sort of <laughs> kind of get into. Uh, and um, I mean, not that anyone understood or even I understood mm -hmm. the context of these objects and, uh, you know, what was happening to me and why I was interested in these things at the time. Um, but so, you know, I emerged when I went to college eventually uh, in Ohio. I'd never been to the States before. And uh, that was the first time I was kind of learning about Western art history. And I was also learning to paint. I, otherwise I taught myself to paint in high school. And I emerged from drawing. So drawing is, um, you know, it's kind of been my best friend and also <laughs> my enemy because I'm always trying to escape it. I feel like I want to be a painter. <laughs> um, so, you know, painting is something I started doing in, I guess, 2003 onward. And then there were different kind of avatars of it that I got into. Um, and for me, the best way to learn my obsessions were just to do with like, you know, Western art history, which later on, you know, my friends would say, I was like, why, why, why just all these like dead white guys? Like, why not just go with, you know, why don't you uh, look at a picture, you know, a miniature picture tradition in, in South Asia, in India. And I have friends who did that beautifully, like, you know, Shazia Sikandar, whose, whose towering success was just, you know, amazing uh, and a beautiful work. But I was interested in the vividness of, of and individuality of, of, of people and the way that it was seen historically in imperial cultures. Um, and um, so, you know, it's a kind of like, I guess, nobility, selfhood, uh, self-love. Um, and I so, you know, I, it excited me to to just confidently go for those th those things for myself without any really any contradiction. Um, I didn't. I certainly didn't feel any. Um, and I wanted to. Just I was obsessed with the surfaces of uh, eight, you know seventeenth century uh, paintings, eighteen the crowdedness of them, the uh, obsession with like single uh, you know light sources, with the musculature of the body to the point where it was you know like a, almost like fetishistic and like all you know completely crazy and out of control, <laughs> um, and um, I wanted to just be as good as some of those painters. And, you know, so whenever I painted, there was this uh, pressure of making a masterpiece because mm -hmm. museums only have masterpieces. Like, you know, they're sort of like the best of the best. You can look at the over of an artist, um, of a painter, even from the, you know, from um, the 18th century, the 17th century in, in Europe and, you can find lots that you maybe just feel a little bit blah about. <laughs> and so I felt like, you know, that pressure actually helped me to not, you know, um, it was good. I wanted to use every material that I was using. Um, I wasn't, you know, I was afraid of being the kind of artist who would, you know, get an expensive panel or canvas, stretch it myself. And then 
just sort of, you know, go at it without any kind of plan or being blah about it. I want it. <laughs> I was very, very meticulous. And, um, but that also required me to use digital images, models. Um, and there was a lot of like stuff in between me and just like painting. Um, I never just like sat down and you just paint it without looking at anything and that became annoying eventually for me. <laughs> I was just like, why? Why should I have to do that? Um, and why don't I just try this? Um, and, um, you know, and eventually I was very, very glad that I got in a place where I, where I tried to just use imagination and, it, and, and to convince myself that, that this was, a, there, there is a sense of play and devil here. Um, and to kind of reach into that playful, like childish, you know, way of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, I, so I got into this kind of painting. And initially I did think that it was, you know, almost like a graphic novel to me. It was very, very vivid. Um, very, uh, to my way of thinking, not very cerebral. It was like not formally, um, you know, breaking new ground. It was more about the uh, urgency and honesty. And uh, so I collected these works in my studio without showing them to anyone because I wasn't. <laughs> I was, they were deeply meaningful to me, but I, I, I thought they were dumb um, and that it would, you know, that I, I wasn't sure what people would say. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, let's talk about those works because, you know, Joseph Henry, who, yes. who wrote the essay for mm -hmm. you in, in the book, talks about how these kind of two approaches sort of developed. And then I also picked up on um, the Whitney essay uh, on, on your work, which, you know, talks about, you know, your deep engagement with academic painting and how knowledgeable you are. Um, and how you've incorporated, you know, their styles into your own original compositions, but also how deeply knowledgeable you are about modern Pakistani and Indian painters. And, and that some of the source material were, were coming from Pakistani advertisements um, and how you sort of blend as, as it says in the essay, many global aesthetic references. Um, and so when, when these paintings that you're ambivalent about, are, are they these paintings that are, have a looser style, a kind of with, with the abstracted uh, figures and, and has, as Joseph says, the, 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 the clash of stylized texts. These are the work you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, uh, this is the work in 2015. And um, I was really, you know, this was, I, I felt like it was too wild for me, ultimately, <laughs> because it was very kind of like splash of painting. It was like unplanned and I was really kind of enjoying being a rock star on my canvas. And I was like, yes, I don't care anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it felt really good for like a year. <laughs> and you know, yeah, I'll just do whatever. I'll just put text in there. Yes, I feel like doing text, I'll, you know, but and what I, but you know, on another level, I was really enjoying identifying uh, people, creating autobiographical work because it was imaginary, uh, and to generate meaning at speed. Uh, and to me, uh, meaning was, you know, my own kind of position being living in between cultures, uh, living between. Uh, a progressive imperial, post-imperial culture, and uh, a conservative culture with which I have a lot of attachment because I grew up there. Um, and um, so, you know, I wanted to create paintings about that and also at the same time, um, identify the kinds of people that I hung out with. Like, what do they wear? What's going on? What, what was the sense of fun how did people forget things how did they remember things um and um what did they kind of think of themselves what is the sense of um you know how is power created through costume uh through um, um and you know what is the relationship between like self-love and like gadgets and pictures that we take of ourselves and um and the poses that we kind of strike um, so that was sort of a beginning, 
not only of like uh, getting away from the various studio contexts, but also um, sort of getting into um, costume and fashion um, as like signifiers, because I loved that element of um, um, that element in, in historical works, uh, both in, you know, in European and in South Asian historical painting, there is, um, it's like you can identify trade routes almost just by looking at the material that people are wearing, the expense of the material, the sensuality of it, the textures. Um, and um, also in, in, the, in the Western world, like you can trace a linear line from a sense of self and, and um, fashion um, in, the, in the cuts and lines and in the way that we see them today. Um, and I absolutely, you know, just really enjoyed doing that, like thinking of imaginary costumes for people. It's almost like, kind of like, you know, it's like being, um, being with a doll or being a stylist. Um, but then also, you know, reimagining what leather looks like or what fur might look like, uh, what is towel like, or, um, and in doing that, I I kind of landed up on abstract ways of of, um, of signifying or or going at it literally or vividly, um, and what I liked about this way of painting was that it was much more meditative. Um, it, for instance, if I he was thinking of a particular kind of face that I wanted to do. I was remembering a friend's face. And if I was doing that, or my mother's face, or someone's face, and I would be thinking about that person for hours because I'm trying to remember them. And there's no, I'm not looking at an image. Um, you know, but apart from being, you know, remembering real people, I also wanted to develop a language of a kind of figuration, which was, which sort of belonged to a world of figuration. Um, that was, that I enjoyed do doing, that was recognizably my own. Um, and in that way, I sort of settled, and I, my hand sort of started tracing out a lot of these characters are very kind of cartoony and Pinocchio-like, um, very kind of like slouchy shoulders. And I just really loved this idea of like um, a slightly sort of funny and depressed person, <laughs> you know? Uh, and like, you know, someone who's locked inside their condition and, but also, you know, it's, it's, you know, the whole thing is funny and like they can laugh about it too. Um, and, um, you know, and to me, I guess I was kind of like a, being an immigrant in the U.S. and also being a post-colonial queer person in my community of origin. And, um, you know, um, and I wanted to turn that into something beautiful. Uh, so, um that you know i wanted those two like non-related things to to meet and in a way like you know what the, looking at a lot of old master paintings taught me with pagan art and a lot of christian art too is that like you know like this kind of idea that losers are winners <laughs> i love that <laughs> you know uh i i love that story so i think that was um um and you know, this kind of, when I'm thinking of that line, I'm also thinking of a particular painting in my grandmother's house. It was a print that once again, like no one really looked at, no one really cared about, it was dusted regularly. But it was a painting by, uh, of called The Stag Hunt by Paul DeVos. And I found out you know, the, the name and everything about it later when I was at college, many years later. Um, and it's a typical kind of 17th century stag hunt picture. These became very popular at a certain time. Uh, the very violent pictures of usually like these hounds just viciously attacking each other or just animal violence. Uh, and he was uh, an animal painter in Rubens studio, but he had his own practice as well. And so there was just something very, very heroic, uh, heroically tragic about the stag hunt picture in which this kind of, <laughs> the stag is just basically being taken down by these dogs that are attacking different parts of its body. And, uh, and the stag has a sort of like, a, almost like a personification of like, it's, you know, looking at the sky in a very saintly way <laughs> uh, while it's writhing, you know. Um, so um, 
you know, there was there was something in that that I think stayed with me, and I see it in the <laughs> in the in the figures and the pictures that I do now, or I, or I want to access that. Um, the the um you know these the other approach sort of the the paintings that you know I've come to to know and and, and love very much are these paintings that depict the intimate moments, the, the vulnerability, you know, of, of young queer brown men and, and, and the sort of the interiors, you know, these domestic, um, you know, private moments, mm -hmm. they can be individual or they can be in the group. And, and I read about uh, how you sort of found your own crew or your own community when you were you know, I mean, I don't know how prepared you were to live in the American Midwest when you decided to go to art school, but, but you did, you did find your community. Um, and it would seem that, that the, the, um, the pictures are um, somehow connected to these days, these, the, the you know, this moment of, 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 I guess, um, really connecting with people who, who, who were like, who were kin, who, you know, were beautiful. You know, I, I always considered myself part of the beautiful losers crew in high school, <laughs> all the misfits, all of the, right. yeah. <laughs> the weirdos, but, but we were awesome. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's some, also some kind of extension into, you know, the, the pictures that you've been making for the last two or three years that maybe there's some connection to looking for that crew when you were first arrived in the, in the United States. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, I kind of dragged down that crew. Um, I mean, first of all, when I arrived, it was like a complete shock because for a year I was just, I was just walking around. I mean, you know, American culture is so pervasive. Do you think anyone would just be prepared for it? But, and I think in, in New York City, it would have been different, but like this was, you know, now it's, even you know so long ago, um, and I was just speechless, <laughs> just walking around because it was so deeply unfamiliar, um, and uh, I was just trying to understand these, uh, like to me at the time, very like, you know, loud, confident, big Americans, um, and um, and I was trying to understand how I didn't understand that I that I had been displaced basically. <laughs> and I was trying to understand how everyone was so comfortable. And like, how did, you know, you know, I'd never lived by myself before then. So I didn't have very many belongings, for instance. And like, I just remember going to people's dorms and seeing like, it was filled with stuff. There was so much stuff. And, you know, like in some, you know, like, you know, a white American would come over to my room and they'd be like, oh, wow, you're like, really, you know, wow, I, I guess like it makes me feel like really bad about my culture because it just has like so much waste and like you have like nothing. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, you know, like I, I think that eventually, you know, I it wasn't by choice. It was just, so I like all of these things were happening and I was, um, you know, in my first art history kind of lessons and I was just absolutely like a sponge um, and weirdly, like I was transposing all of those ideas onto like this like college town campus and onto the cornfields and the football fields. And, uh, and where I found it the most actually um, was in a hippie commune because like just it was, you know, uh, learning about the early Renaissance and stuff and there was just so much like, you know, big and pastoral stuff that we would have to like, you know, cram for like an exam. And it's just, you know, so into uh, those paintings and um, learning as fast as I could. And, um, and but also, you know, um, finally kind of like answering the questions and these vague ideas that had been in my head since I, I was very little. And I was like, oh, so that's what this was, you know? And, um, and so I kind of found that, um, ideal in a very, very accepting, cozy uh, Victorian house, which was an on-campus, like sort of heavy house called the House of Peace and Justice. And um, um, 
and yeah, I mean, now it kind of seems like a fantasy. There was like just like live sort of jamming music all the time. There was lots of nakedness, there were lots of dancing, and like, you know, now it, you know, it kind of it seems a bit like costumey to me when I think about it, even, but like, you know, just like American ideas of what, uh, you know, pre colonial cultures are like. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, so it was like coming back full circle in a way and it was also feeding and fertilizing my imagination because I was like oh wow so like things get sort of transformed when they travel or when, they, or when they're taken or, or, or just over time and they get mixed up and like just you know used as as needed by <laughs> and you know and, um, and and in a sense you know it was also just interesting to see like American ideas about what, you know, uh, or the lack thereof of where, of the region that I was coming from. And, um, you know, at the same time I was learning about the native um, like history in America. And so all of that I felt for me was happening inside probably like, you know, they were all the children of hippies and it was like a leftover dream, Arcadia. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a very, very good way to go through college. I think I was very lucky to find that community. Um, and um, yeah, and I, you know, I made paintings about them even at the time and now, um, you know, the paintings that I guess we were talking about, about the safe spaces in them, the coziness, that is absolutely so important to me because I came from a culture in which I like there wasn't an absolute sense of safety in public spaces um and um and after I had about 20 of these paintings I was looking at them in the studio and I thought wow okay I'm I'm making and just trying to imagine safe spaces all the time that's even though I feel safe why do I keep doing this um but it, it is it gives me a lot of pleasure and happiness to just it's a sense of abundance of 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 uh, domesticity um, and and the safety and coziness of spaces in which people uh, can have uh, can be themselves. You know, um, even though like I live in New York City, that's not you know I can be myself anywhere, but uh, in a sense. But um, you know, um, and there was also a lot of excitement for me to show. Um, you know, like an urban bourgeois life populated by people that I didn't really see in paintings before doing, living those lives. Um, you know, um, for instance, I would have like this fantasy of like, you know, living in like, you know, you know, an artist community in Manier's Paris, like, you know, there is a whole new class of people suddenly who are trying new things and redefining what living in a city means and the city and the urban as like this progressive hub that sends signals to the, to the provinces and abroad about what's okay, what is the new way of living. And um, so there was a lot of excitement in that. Um, and there were certain body types that I also uh, felt and that in a sense like formally kind of joined me in language with Philip Guston and Nicole Eisenman and they're sort of like very skinny, long, <laughs> you know, uh, curvy limbs with like hairs on them. Um, and, um, and to be in spaces in which I would imagine, you know, in a, in a, in a, on a bad, in a bad moment, I would imagine, you know, like thinking in, in another time that I would be asked to leave or like, or, or that kind of body would not be allowed in that space. Um, and, um, you know, the idea of uh, domestic flounciness uh, and uh, a kind of creamy um, sense of um, sanitary, like cleanliness. Like, I just, I, I want to see that. I want to, I want to create an abundance of images until, um, until it doesn't, it, until it's not exciting anymore. And I think it's exciting because there aren't enough. Um, um, you know, there are some kind of figures in, in, in like mainstream media that 
sort of point in those directions, but we need more. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so those are some of the kind of the things that drew me to paintings. Yes, I so agree with you that the, the it, you can never underestimate the importance of being able to to see yourself um, in a sort of a variety, you know, uh, to really feel like you are part you are a participant and acknowledged as such. And so I agree with you. There cannot we you know there is not enough, and we and we could definitely welcome more. Yeah. And and so you're addressing that in a beautiful way with and, and inviting i think that um you know uh young young artists or uh um young people who will see your work will feel you know sort of part of the discussion part of you know the um the world that 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 they want that they you know very much i'm like i am here so why am i not also you know sort of reflected back to myself it's just such an um an important thing to do and to to acknowledge um and so i was wondering if we could talk about then the making the, the process and materials and because mm -hmm. i've read that you paint from memory and you were yeah. you know saying how you don't you know have a reference um uh to work from and that it's about the, you follow the unfolding. And I would like to, yeah, talk about how you start with drawing um, because I was following the unfolding of the work you made in the show and, and in regards to materials, if you swear allegiance to, you know, a certain set of materials. Yes. So, um, you know, that was a larger painting on panel that I did for the show. And so um, I, in some paintings, it's true that I like I do. I have a little diary, a drawing diary, and I love using ballpoint, as um, because there's something about it. It works like a pencil, um, but it doesn't. It's I feel like it's more archival. It doesn't smudge. It's just there. It's like an engraving almost once you're done with it. So I do little drawings um, and uh, from imagination. As usually, like as soon as they occur to me, I'm like, if I'm gonna train, I'll just quickly do it if it's very, if I like it a lot, I'll do another drawing, refining it a little bit. Um, and then, you know, those kinds of drawings to end up in some permutation in a painting um, because I just remember the maps of, of, of the drawings. Um, and so um, usually I like using like panel to make paintings because um, I just do it myself, I really kind of, make it very, very smooth until any kind of, you know, paint that's worked on it has a very visible trace so that if you look at the painting long enough, if you can, you can see how it was made. And I really like that. Um, so that the sense of touch in the painting and it's pretty sensual, I think in some parts of the paintings, is also echoed in the way that the, in parts that the brush lightly touches uh, the surface. Uh, so that to me, like it can seem like a just a little bit like musical notes, almost like, um, you know, noise or musical notes or something like that, like it, that it travels uh, and it creates like dilemmas and dramas, <laughs> you know, on the surface. Um, and um, so I usually start with a very dark ground and I just paint lightly on it directly. So there's no drawing under the painting. Um, and, um, you know, usually I have to, there are several stages of development and things don't always go as they're planned. For instance, it's very important to me that the faces be the exactly the face that I want and, 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 and the gestures of, of the hands doing different things. Um, and I, so usually sometimes the face has to go through several renovations. Like it's like, oh no, the, you know, this, this, uh, this person looks like they're too present. I want them to be a little lost. Oh, the nose is too big. No, it has to be small. No, they don't, they look too, you know, uh, like noble, they need to be made funnier. Um, and so those are, you know, those are real adjustments to me. Like I need the tone to be absolutely right. Um, and, um, 
for me, I mean. Um, and then there are just, you know, the, the ideas of um, kind of costume and value that keep changing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, does this, is this person going to be, am I thinking of someone very conservative from like a village in Punjab, you know? Or am I, to, am I thinking of like a friend of mine who grew up in New York, but is of South Asian origin. Um, and, you know, so I want to, in a painting, kind of take those different tropes and signals and mix them up and so that they sort of misfire all the time. And I really enjoy that because um, they're sort of bits and pieces of what um, almost like immigration officers collect to identify, to ID who you are. Um, and, um, you know, before I became a citizen, which was recently, I um, traveled a, a lot. And so just like entering and leaving the country, there was like, a, it was an, like immigration as an encounter that didn't really stop when it ended. It was very much a declaration of, you know, who you need to be in order to stay on or even enter. And um, so in, you know, I, I, I like to kind of pose the different uh, kind of empowering uh, and fun paintings uh, with, with these, you know, kind of confrontational, meditative, slightly bleak paintings um, of, of, you know, reflected self images. So there's, there are paintings in which their self love is augmented. Um, and the idea of the individual is augmented. And then I want these group paintings in which people are kind of bunched up together. And, um, and to, you know, what I'm thinking of when I'm painting these is that they're not, um, they're not, you know, it's, they're not the same kind of people, actually. They're very, very different, you know, um, sort of mixed up tropes of things. Uh, and, um, you know, kind of um, wanting to turn that literal bureaucratic situation into like a surreal, allegorical one. Um, yeah. Well, that's a great way for us to maybe talk a little bit more about the group, which was an, a, a, yeah. a you know, brand new work for, uh, for the show. Um, and it is a contrast from the domestic and, and interiors that you'd been exploring and casts a reality check on the vulnerability of um, being at the border, um, passing through the, uh, the frontier or going through customs. And it, and it definitely seems like, you know, it's an extension of, of um, works that you'd made like Immigration Men, for example. Um, and I would love to hear you, um, I guess, dissect this work for us because there have been some wonderful readings um, that, uh, that have been had sort of over the course of the time when the show was open because we're closed again right now, yeah. but, but um, yes, I would love to hear you speak about it because I, I think there's some interesting relationships with them. Some of the other uh, approaches that you've had in, in, in um, previous works that I would love to hear about. Um, so, in, you know, in this work, I've wanted to have a crazy group of things like these people together like just you know someone holding like a, a trope of like a ball person with like a sack on their back and like uh you know and there is a whole history of how uh well some you know beaten weather people are shown in paintings in european paintings as well as in uh, you know images of fakirs and beggars in in south asian uh painting as a Sufi sages. Um, and so I, you know, I, I just love that idea that, and I find it so amusing that, you know, that you kind of, they end up in like rich sort of princes albums in South Asia um, and, um, and uh, in the 16th and 17th century in Europe, like paintings of peasants and taverns being 
rowdy and drunk and you know kind of pissing in a bar full of like hay on the ground just these kind of nasty comedies were like so enjoyed by the rich <laughs> uh, and that, that they had their own genres like they're like you know uh father and son teams that just go on for generation after generation doing these you know from bruegel and others onward um and uh, so I, you know, I just like moving in between the elegance of uh, refinement and uh, the grime um, of, um, or the imagined grime of, of um, I think, in, in another word, let's say like a savage, someone of the outside, outside what is considered civilization. Um, and um, I wanted to kind of back all of that. Um, and I was looking at the time at Manet's uh, Bunch of Asparagus. Um, and I, I just felt like, wow, I think these are people to me. Like I just wanted to like bunch them up like, <laughs> like a bunch of asparagus. Um, and, you know, in a way that is not that kind of posed, it's sort of like, you know, these people sort of arrived at your door and you open the door and you're just like, what do you want? <laughs> you know? Uh, and, you know, and to me, they're almost like the spirits, they're not even people. Um, and, um, you know, and sometimes they don't, like, for instance, the person in the middle of the, with the top hat and the plume and the hat, I just felt like, you know, I wanted to create, I just wanted to paint that costume. It was the totally cosmetic decision. Mm -hmm. um, I was just like, no, I want a dog hat, I want a feather. And so maybe he's from another time, he's another kind of immigrant. Um, you know, why does it have to be in the same time? And then, you know, also like an inability to have like a complete allegiance to like a style that is just like all over. They kind of change, um, you know, so like one person's sort of face is done a little bit like in one, way of painting and the other, the other one is a bit sketchy and what I was trying to there was like a little bit of a principle in my head which was that the further back the figures go the more kind of abstracted they become so um <laughs> so you know like there's sort of like ideas or cartoons the further back they go as if like they're just back in time they can't be seen very clearly um uh, or they have they become reductions of something. Um, and um, so, you know, there's almost like a battle between expressions uh, and uh, emotions and patterns. So actual, um, you know, like um, herringbone patterns, stripes, and, and then, you know, there are batches of uh, the surface where there are sort of agitations um, like um, that are mimic the texture of fur or light. Light is very important to me. It kind of um, emerges from certain gestures or it uh, also, um, you know, uh, exists from, it comes out of gadgets. Um, and, um, you know, I just, for instance, the, there is a man in the foreground in this painting, which he's holding hands and I wanted the hands to be, to kind of just like encapsulate all these various forms of piety that I'd seen. And, um, and you know, once again, like, you know, the miniature tradition in Iran and South Asia and the, and, and in European paintings is like the kind of a summary of so many kind of, um, magical tragedies that happened in these paintings in which people, you know, especially in the Christian story where people sort of just like quietly, you know, gather their hands. Um, and, you know, in a sense, I was just thinking, you know, what, what, what does that kind of person think about my life <laughs> here, which is like not, which is like, you know, crazy. I mean, it's not that I don't, you know, I'm evil or don't believe in anything, but like, I just wanted that to be at once a gesture of love, but also uh, confusing it with deep conservatism mm -hmm. and limitedness. And, um, you know, and at the same time, like remembering in my head, like, you know, faces um, that would, at, from my own country or region, that would scoff at the triumph of liberal values in this part of the world or laugh at me or, 
you know, show a lot of hatred for things that, you know, uh, at some point in my life I was very used to. Um, so I just, I kind of want to mix all those things up to create a full story and hopefully not, you know, kind of have a rounded picture. Absolutely. Um, you know, there, there is so much going on, you know, in, in that, in that work. Uh, the man in the top hat indicates, my reading was this kind of timelessness, um, you know, this kind of transcending of past and, and present as well, which I feel is very much part of the diasporic experience where we don't really make these kind of clear delineations between what is past and what is what is contemporary they always seem to find themselves in dialogue uh, in a regular and constant way um and then that electronic gadget which is somewhat ambiguous it uh, it disrupts again the essential readings of time um and i love how there's this kind of you know there's sort of a feeling of torpor, you know, in, in their waiting. Um, the expressions are, are very much that of piety and vulnerability, but this sweet pathos as well. Um, and then the mene, you know, there's another mene-esque sort of device that, that comes out. Um, you know, the very first painting I saw of yours was the bar on East 13th Street. And of course, you know, a very interesting uh, art historical reference. And then here we also have the table that creates that border, that frontier, a framing device with, with us on the other side in, the, in a similar way, which is really gets you thinking, you know, sort of uh, uh, throughout, throughout time, throughout reference, throughout, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of strict delineations of Western painting and painting through a diasporic consciousness. Um, so there, it's very rich. And, there, and I was also interested in about like the hands and, and the interest in legs and limbs and, and these really big hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there's something monstrous about them that I like. Um, you know, I, and also because I, I want, I love the idea that the limbs are sort of like joined together, they're cobbled together like noses, ears. They're not, you know, they weren't originally this you know, part of the same sort of structure. They were like put together uh, so that people have the very different parts and sometimes like they're made of different parts and sometimes these people forget who they were. <laughs> and um, so I, yeah, I, I really, um, you know, that's that's one of the reasons that for the for the big hands. Mm. Um, and the mene part is definitely, I think that in this painting is probably because of the top hat. There's so many like black top hats in Paris at the time. Um, but there is this idea of negotiation across the table. And, you know, with diaspora, yes, a negotiation is definitely a word that comes up a lot because they have to negotiate. Um, the present and you have to like uh, constantly and constant reinvention um, because it's part of a relationship to a place that's far away. Um, it almost becomes like a religion because that place is not here. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it is also um, part of memory um, and the memory goes on and it has to have like, it has to develop uh, with the present into the future. And so it's constantly changing. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what we all love about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also sort of, you know, getting to know you better, uh, is noticing that you write extremely well, that, that you are, you're a, crit you're a wonderful art critic and enviably good. <laughs> <laughs> is that something that you would continue to do with everything else, with such a busy practice? I would love to. I would love to write about art. Uh, I mean, I have um, admired so many writers, uh, especially, I mean, I'm still such a huge fan of Robert Hughes, Peter Sheldon. Um, you know, even though, like, you know, when I was re recently reading a, an anthology of Robert Hughes' criticism that was from the 80s and 90s in Time magazine. And, you know, 
on the one hand, it's an amazing set of skills and knowledge. And on the other hand, he's talking from the other side of globalization, like just like the whole world to a lot of the critics was just Europe and the US. And like, anyway, so, but um, that was a tangent, but like, yeah, I, I would absolutely love to write about art. I've just had, um, I feel like I'm still kind of downloading all my education here that I need to know. I could write very confidently um, about my, well, Chelsea, I'm sort of a, you know, a, a friend at the time when I wrote uh, an, an article about Chelsea Sikandar's work in Friday Times in Pakistan. Uh, and then I would regularly go to thesis shows uh, at the National College of Arts in Lahore to write about, um, you know, a, 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 the annual event there. Um, but what's happening, you know, in, especially in this, figurative moment in New York City with uh, new people looking at uh, at, uh, um, at times oppressive art history is, this is a new phenomenon and I am so interested in looking um, at shows and, and writing about, um, I guess like a kind of milieu, it is a kind of, um, it's happening right now and it's very, very exciting. Well, I think the tangent that you, you know, sort of gave us a glimpse of is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you may, you know, indeed have a very important voice as, as a critic as well. Uh, I would love to talk so much more about clothing <laughs> and style with you, about, you know, whether you would imagine yourself a dandy and also thinking <laughs> uh, about uh, sort of uh, what I perceive as a bit of an autoethnographic approach in some ways and that I see you sometimes, you know, in, in your paintings and in the way that, you know, John Curran sort of, you know, summons up his assistant and his wife over and over again in the figures. Um, one other little observation because I've been looking again at, at, at some of um, you know, some, all the paintings that I could get access to <laughs> online, <laughs> was how uh, this lovely um, uh, parallel between uh, John Curran's painting, The Berliner, and your man with ice cream cone. <laughs> yeah. So sweet. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, sort of like that's again, that sweet pathos, which is a very, very difficult it's fun a thin line. Yeah. You know, to capture. Anyhow, it was just something that I, I thought was really, I delighted in anyway, that kind of interesting parallel. Absolutely. I, 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 I agree with you. I spent a lot of time looking at John Curran's work because in 2006, and uh, until 2009, when I was at Pratt in New York here, there were very, very few figurative artists. It wasn't fashionable at all uh, to do work like that. There was Nicole Eisenman, John Curran, and Kanye Wiley. There were people on my radar. And, um, and, you know, I would constantly look at it. It's like, how do they do this? You know, like, I want to understand more about, uh, you know, I wanted, and, you know, I wanted to know every single painting that they had ever done. If there was a new work that I hadn't seen, it was like Christmas for me, like it was just, you know. Um, and, you know, Berliner, the John Curran painting is like not, it's uh, it's not one of his most well-known ones. No, no. Even though I think it's the cover of the um, catalog for his oh. new book called Men, <laughs> which happened in the South uh, at a museum. Uh, here and um, so yeah, you know, I uh, also because I was very um, uh, fascinated by the common interest. He was all very much into old masters, although I didn't really agree with a lot of the stuff that he painted. Uh, you know, it was um, it wasn't really uh, you know my cup of tea, but the way that it was painted was really admirable, uh, and I learned so much by looking at it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I learned so much from him. I was just, I just sort of popped into my head, um, you know, so when, when I was looking at some of these paintings and uh, um, I mean, if we had another, maybe we'll, maybe we'll do another, you know, sort of addendum to this because I, you know, there were things we didn't talk about, like your use of green and your relationship to that oh, color, but you know. I've been so chatty and we didn't get there, you know, yeah, we didn't get that far. 
Oh, but Salman, this has just been incredibly generous. Uh, uh, such a pleasure to listen to you speak. And, you know, thank you again for, uh, you know, granting us this opportunity to share your work with uh, the Montreal public and then soon perhaps the Calgary public. So, uh, <laughs> that would be great. And I'm hoping we'll be able to actually see each other in the not too distant future. Yes, please. I would like that. I mean, the show, the Whitney show will be on until April. So just get in touch if you're in town. I will be here. I'll just be away from December, but I'll be back. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Thank you very much. All right. Take good care. You too. Bye. Bye.